All right, let's do it. Thank you everyone for joining this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we're gonna talk about will the real AI please stand up? As, uh, hopefully you can see our faces. Uh, as you can see, Mario and I dressed up explicitly for this uh, web conference. We normally do not wear pants to the office, but in case there's any sort of standing up involved, we'll be able to do that safely and without any sort of harm. Um, uh, it's, it's great to have you there. Just quick introductions. I'm Stefan Ju. I'm the CTO here at Interstat, uh, background in analytics, uh, lots of uh, fun and excitement, uh, implementing analytical systems to solve some really hard problems and uh, some really important problems, and very excited to talk about what types of AI uh, can be applied to solve some really hard and important problems inside cybersecurity, and how you can tell the difference between effective AI, uh, so-called real AI, and what's um, maybe not quite as effective as it could be. And uh, with me is uh, Mario as well. Mario, say hello. Hi everyone, my name is Mario Daigle. Um, also like to find a background in analytics. Uh, prior to this, I spent many years in the Cognos IBM uh, companies doing product management, various types of um, analytics visualization, those sorts of things. So um, really happy to be here and thanks for joining us. All right, so right at the top, I wanna uh, make one thing clear. Uh, this is, this could be a really technical talk, but it's my intention not to make it very technical. I don't think we need a lecture in artificial intelligence, as, as much fun as that would be for me. Uh, we're also going to uh, scope it to cybersecurity. So there's a lot to AI, there's a lot of techniques, there's a lot of technologies. There's certainly a lot of uh, really impressive work that is going on across the board in many areas of the industry. But we want to sort of focus on cybersecurity specifically because that's what our day jobs are. And I also want to touch a little bit on different types of AI and different types of machine learning in particular. But I want to frame it in the context of uh, hopefully useful information that will help you kind of evaluate um, what type of AI a particular vendor is using, uh, what type of technology is applicable to a specific problem, and what type of technology might not be applicable. So that's, that's kind of my goal. If we can sort of move on to the next slide, please, Mara, we can, uh, we can get started. Um, I'll also mention, just in terms of logistics, uh, we are happy to take whatever questions you might have at the end of the presentation. We're going to give you some information. We're going to show you a live demonstration of AI um, in, in progress and how that looks inside uh, our, our Intercept product. But we are happy to take questions at the end. So whenever you, something comes to mind, if there's something that we mentioned that you would like additional information on or additional detail, please feel free to enter it into the interface and uh, we'll address them at the end of the, um, at the, end of the demo. Okay? So with that said, it's, it's really no surprise that there's uh, this huge amount of interest in AI. I mean, every, every week it's like there's some major announcement that involves AI. And, whether it's uh, AI for good, like uh, Google and self-driving cars, or AI for you know, less good reasons, like uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, there is certainly no shortage of progress that seems to be coming in from all areas of the universe related to AI. And there's certainly a lot of reasons to think about how AI can be applied to cybersecurity. Indeed, if you think about everything from Siri and uh, the Google Voice Assistant, to uh, some of the uh, things you might have heard about AI generating pieces of art or uh, music or uh, film scores. You know, it, it's pretty impressive what the possibilities of really good AI seem to offer uh, us inside cybersecurity. With that said, next slide please. The unfortunate side effect of that is it feels like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is almost everywhere. Uh, all you need to do is go to RSA, for example, and you'll see no shortage of technologies and products and vendors, uh, of which I confess we are one for sure, but they will use terms like we use artificial intelligence, our, um, our machine learn learning uh, has 100% uh, no false positives, uh, they'll uh, assault you with uh, different algorithm lanes like recursive Bayesian estimation. And I can truly sympathize with, with you if you are in the process of evaluating different technologies to find the right fit for your organization 
and for the cybersecurity challenges that are top of mind for you. It truly is a confusing place. So what I wanted to do, as I said earlier, there's a lot to AI that I can talk about, but in the context of cybersecurity, in the context of the use cases that we can solve today effectively with AI, uh, there are kind of uh, two main categories specifically of machine learning that we should keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. And these two categories are widely known as supervised and unsupervised. So if there's one thing that you take out of this webinar today, I'm hoping you develop an intuitive understanding of what these two classes of machine learning are and what they're good at. Because I think that is the most important question that you can ask yourself and the vendor and the technology to see if there's a good fit. Because to be honest, one is not better than the other. One just happens to be more applicable to one set of use cases and a second technique is applicable to a second set of use cases. To make matters worse, um, the, the, uh, the, the, um, there, there's a lot of, I guess, pressure on people to sort of jump right to algorithms, right? It's very impressive when you say, oh, we do recursive Bayesian estimation, or we do linear regression, or we do generalized linear methods, and so on and so forth. It sounds very impressive. And don't get me wrong, it's probably important for you to ask questions about the underlying algorithms. But even this diagram that you see here in the webinar, it's already a simplification of algorithms and how they relate to supervised versus unsupervised. It is, um, it is not the case that if you are using ensemble methods, which you see uh, kind of in the middle of the green column, that you are only looking at a regression-based system that is exclusively used supervised approaches. The reality is uh, there is uh, apl applicability of different algorithms to different use cases uh, and including the scenario where something that is a, an unsupervised problem can be solved using supervised methods and vice versa, right? So don't get me wrong, it's important to sort of get an understanding of the algorithms just because it's an easy question to ask, but it is not um, I think quite as cut and dry to be able to say, okay, here are the algorithms, they all fall under unsupervised, therefore this is an unsupervised um, technology, right? Uh, unfortunately, I wish it was that simple, but, but it's not. So what I wanna do instead is go up a level instead, and I want you to just temporarily forget about these algorithms. I, I, I mean, I can talk about these all day, but for the time being, let's just try and get an understanding, an intuitive understanding of supervised versus unsupervised, and what they mean. And so instead of the words supervised, I want us to think about it as learning by example. And then instead of the words unsupervised, I want us to think about that as learning by observation. So by example, by observation. Let's drill into those two categories a little bit and then uh, at the end of them, uh, sort of map it back to cybersecurity and hopefully that'll be helpful. Next slide, please, Mario. So when I think about supervised learning, uh, this is learning by example. This is very similar to the way most of us were taught in school or when we learn the names of things uh, as we grew up uh, from a very young age and learned to speak English. So basically, when something is a supervised um, problem that needs to be solved using supervised methods, what you typically have is you have a set of data and you have associate with that data set a set of answers. Uh, and basically by giving, uh, by looking at the answers, so these examples that you have, and by sort of understanding the relationship between the raw data and the answer column, uh, you're able to develop learning that allows you to see an example in the future and give it that name. So an example here, which you see in this illustration, is you have a bunch of items and some of them are animals and some of them are, are food. And as you can see there, sometimes it's actually quite difficult to actually know the difference between a dog and a muffin, just purely visually. But guess what? Supervised machine learning approaches actually can make that determination. With enough examples, um, it actually can do a pretty good job at learning the fine differences between something that visually looks very similar, right? That, that's, that's the promise of machine learning. Uh, 
that is all predicated on having enough data. If you do not have enough examples, like if, if all you had in the third column here are these four examples of a blueberry muffin versus a dog then, uh, versus a chihuahua, then uh, it, any machine learning algorithm will struggle. Just like how any um, child that is just looking at these pictures for the first time might take a little bit of time before it learns the differences between a dog and, um, and, and the muffin. Um, in fact, the, the nature of data and the amount of data and the number of correct labels that you have in that data, the number of examples that you have, in other words, is so important that typically the data that you have and the amount of it is much more important than the actual algorithm that you choose to perform your supervised machine learning. Right? It's, it's a well sort of understood result that the data actually trumps the algorithm that you choose. So with enough data, uh, you can actually do amazing stuff. And so if we go on to the next slide, the, the, the nice thing about supervised approaches is it allows you to sort of categorize things once you have enough examples. And it's important when you start think about the data set and the problem, you need to start think about how generalizable the data is, because that's what's going to make the models, the algorithms work inside your environment. So here's a good example. Um, it is good for supervised machine learning to have um, a problem like, given this face, what emotion is that person displaying? And the reason is twofold. Reason number one is we actually have a lot of data out there. You can imagine trolling YouTube or images on, on, the, on the web. And if you have enough time and you can label them happy, sad, happy, sad, angry, and so on and so forth, then there is no shortage of information that is sufficiently large for a machine learning algorithm to learn that, hey, if the uh, mouth is turned up a certain way and the eyebrows are angled a certain way and if the cheat structure is uh, um, uh, positioned a certain way, then this person is probably happy. On the other hand, if it's uh, positioned this way, then this person is probably sad. Just like how with enough data, we can learn the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua, with enough data, a machine learning model using supervised methods can learn to tell the difference without being told uh, as to sort of what emotion the person is, is displayed. That's reason one, we've got lots of data. Reason number two is that the problem it is solving is actually very generalizable. Uh, it doesn't matter if the uh, human picture that the machine learning algorithm is seeing for the first time has never been seen before by the machine learning algorithm. It is almost universal the way the human race displays happiness versus sadness versus anger, right? So you can build a model on a million faces and then apply that model to a million new faces that the algorithm has never seen before and the answers will be correct, right? That's what I mean by generalizable. So that's, that's a really good, uh, useful thing that it lends itself to be perfect for supervised approaches. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so in contrast, so that was learning by example. Now let's talk about learning by observation. So this is different. So the main difference is we are not giving answers. We are not giving specific labels for an algorithm to learn. Instead, we're just giving an algorithm a bunch of data and we're saying, here are a bunch of unlabeled data and I want you to find interesting combinations. I want you to find things that are similar to each other. I want you to find groups. I want you to find things that are normally associated with each other. So it's a little bit more difficult to define uh, in words, but the idea here is that with enough data and with enough observation, you can learn that, hey, these things are very similar to each other, right? Just like how a child can learn that there's this one group of animals that I see all the time on the street, and they might not know that they're called dogs, but the child would learn that they all have long hair and, and long tails and they all make a barking sound. On the other hand, there's another separate group of animals that the child might learn are cats. And they might, the child, without being told, might not know that they're called cats as, with, with the name uh, spelled C-A-T, but they might learn that they make this meowing sound, they have short hair and typically shorter tails, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's unguided in that respect. So you have algorithms that actually are really good at that. And again, with enough data, 
you don't have to have all the answers. You don't need labels, so that's the advantage. You're still able to derive value out of it. Next slide, please. So the example is instead of trying to look at a face and understanding whether that face is happy or sad or angry, I want you to think about the problem where we're trying to understand when this person has, is happy. What's the context that actually makes that person happy? Next slide, please. So one possible set of clues might be a set of circumstances like this. Uh, so if you look at the A versus B column, you know, perhaps this person is happy when they are wearing bright clothing or when they are messing around with props. Right? That's one possibility given this data that I see here. If I look at the second column, perhaps this person is happy when they are cleaning the kitchen or cooking a meal. Or perhaps this person is happy, if I look at the third column, when they uh, just left the coffee shop with their favorite coffee or they're making coffee at home. So perhaps they're a coffee lover and so on and so forth. So actually with enough clues, we can identify these patterns, these combinations that are normal for a specific user, in this case, this uh, person that we sort of picked up. Okay? So we're not defining a specific set of things for them to look at explicitly like we were when we were saying, this is happy, this is sad, this is angry. Instead, we're giving the algorithm a lot of data and saying, what's the context for normal? And the reason this matters is because building an understanding for normal patterns of normal behavior is very important for anomaly detection. And anomaly detection within the space of unsupervised learning is probably the most important technique for cybersecurity today. Okay, so let's look at the next slide and let's, uh, we can uh, bring it back to cybersecurity. So uh, one way of thinking about it is also uh, sort of learning by example as a classroom environment versus learning by observation, which is what you sort of learn by being out in the real world, right? In a classroom, you're told the answers, you're learning based on information that the teacher gives you, and so you're building up your learning model from that. That's different when you're just wandering around the streets, picking up observations, learning, hey, this is uh, what's normal social behavior for Harry. This is what makes Harry happy. He likes to drink coffee. And Harry perversely enjoys cleaning his house, right? So that's the difference between supervised versus unsupervised. And another way of thinking about it, next slide please, is to sort of map it back to the original data set. So let's imagine that we had the same set of images as before. Dogs, animals, cats, and so on, and food products. And we didn't give any labels, so there are no names. So there's nothing that tells the algorithm that this is a food, this is an animal. If we, instead of looking at this as a supervised learning problem, like the original slide, if we thought of this as an unsupervised, what are the things that an algorithm might automatically define and discover on its own? And that's on the next slide. So this is what I mean by learning by observation. An unsupervised algorithm will learn these patterns of normal behavior. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can see we've sort of limited to the visual domain. So all of these clusters look visually similar. You can imagine if there's other input related to the sound that this uh, object makes or whether the object moves or not, it might come up with different clusters as well. But that's the idea, is coming up with patterns of common behaviors in order to understand and build an understanding of what normal behavioral patterns are for each and every item inside the data set. Next slide, please. So why is this important? It's important for cybersecurity because the technique and the set of AI technologies that you choose matters. It matters a lot. And it matters a lot based on the use case that you're trying to solve. When I think about malware, uh, malware is perfect for supervised machine learning methods. So when you evaluate um, a company that uses AI to solve a problem like malware, you should think about the data or ask about the data set. And in this case, the data set for malware is huge. We've had decades of malware, we've got decades of binaries that we can learn from, and we know whether something is malware or not. So you can derive information that can be learned in a model on a separate set of examples, a very large set of malware examples. You can build those models in lab, and then you can deploy them 
super effectively uh, inside your environment. In other words, the data set is big and it generalizes really well, right? If the malware looks the same in your environment as it does in this data set, then the model works perfect. Next slide, please. However, when you think about other use cases, like insider threat is kind of the easiest example for me to, to pick on, um, that is a perfect example of unsupervised machine learning. Uh, that is because one nice way of identifying insider threat or attacks that might be external but end up having inside evidence like compromised account. Uh, you can think about things like here's an account that is normally never active at midnight but all of a sudden just is and that's unusual. Or here's an account that just sent 500 megabytes in an email that has never done that before and so on. So these are all examples of patterns of normal behavior that can be derived from data but don't require any labels because guess what? There are no labels in insider threat. No one has a large data set like we have malware of saying here's a you know 30 days of Active Directory logs and there are exactly five insider threats here and here they are. Those data sets are very very difficult to come by. So problem number one, we don't have a large data set with a large number of labels. So that already tells us we should probably think about unsupervised methods. Problem number two is that even if we did have a data set, will the information in that data set, will those models that learn from this data set, will they generalize to your environment? And for pretty well all insider threats, the answer is no, right? The person that stole data from a bank or Sony is going to manifest itself differently inside your employee base, right? The, the models that train on one data set uh, even if we had that data set, they, they aren't going to generalize inside your environment. So you need a technique that actually leverages data that you've already got, but doesn't require labels. And so, so when you sort of think about the data set and think about the use case, that's really the best way to think about how you can evaluate the real effective AI from the sort of AI that won't be as effective for your particular use case. Next slide. So basically, that's the general idea. Um, you know, there are lots of other things that you can drill into. Of course, you can ask about algorithms, and you should be nervous about anyone that is unwilling to share openly about the algorithms that they use. Of course, you should ask about, um, you know, reference customers and how widely deployed this technology is. That's very important because you know nothing, nothing is uh, is as uh, proven as data sets and technology that is already proven. But from an AI perspective, my suggestion is that the best thing you can do is uh, ask about the use case or ask about how, you know, the particular type of AI or ML in this technology applies to the use case that you have in mind. And then with an understanding of unsupervised and supervised, ask about the data set that is tied to it. What do these models, data do these models learn on and how does that apply to my environment? And how do you refresh that information? So just asking those two questions about the data, comparing that to your use case and supervised versus unsupervised, I think will already put you ahead of the game from anyone else, um, or the, I would say the vast majority of the people that are sort of struggling inside this space. Okay. okay, with that said, uh, I'd love to